good evening everybody uh, welcome to all uh, participants we are in the uh, 10th uh, lecture of uh, archaeological sciences center webinar series of iit gandhinagar and today uh, continuing with the indus uh, studies or the harappan civilization studies we have been listening to a series of talks on harappan civilization and today we have a special guest uh, Uh, joining us from japan dr akinori oyasugi uh, welcome aki uh, it's it's really an honor to have you i mean you have been associated with south asia for a pretty long period since your uh, phd days and you have worked in uh, each and every uh, uh, area of uh, south asian archaeology be it uh, early historic period of shravasti uh, the iron age uh, south india who i mean where you are working uh, uh, recently and your contribution in the in the harappan archaeology is commendable i mean we have been reading your uh, reports on kanmer farmana giravad mitatal what not i mean it's it's really uh, fantastic and to 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 uh, read your uh, uh, in depth uh, analysis on whether it is pottery or seals or beads so we have uh, participants we have a scholar who has an in depth idea of uh, the entire uh, gamut of uh, south asian archaeology and uh, uh, he uh, he actually uh, uh, fi- uh, completed his uh, phd uh, from the kansai university osaka and the uh, it is related to the urbanization in the ganga ganga valley and uh, as i as i told you earlier he has been working intensely uh, on the in the indus archaeology since 2003 and recently he is uh, taken up uh, the iron age early historical archaeology of uh, and south asia and he he has been recently also working on the uh, dilman bur- burial mounds dilman uh, refers to modern uh, modern day bahrain and it is uh, referred in the cuneiform records of the mesopotamians how uh, dilman magan and meluha they were important for the commercial trade activities during their third millennium uh, bce So once again, I welcome Akinori uh, to, to this talk, and we are really honored to have you uh, with us. And without wasting much time, I will I request you to please uh, deliver the lecture. Okay, thank you very much, Prabhakar. I mean, for a nice uh, introduction about about me, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, sevi- uh, webinar. So I'm I am going to share the screen. Okay, this one uh, here. Okay, and this. Okay, can you see the screen? Yes. Okay. Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, very good. Okay, so I am Akinori Wesugi from Japan. I am affiliated to the Kanazawa University in Japan, and uh, today's uh, uh, top the topic of the today's presentation is maritime trace between the Indus civilization or Harappan civilization and Bahrain towards the end of the Indus urban period. Okay, so before going to the main topic, I mean I would like to say thanks to Dr. V. N. Prabhakar, Dr. Michel Danino, and Dr. Sharada Shivi. for giving me an opportunity to present my work in Bahrain and uh, I am also thankful to many many people many many scholars and institutions for making my research projects are uh, possible so I like to say thanks to them okay so uh, uh, I'm going to start the start my talk on the main topic So I mean the Bahrain island is the main topic of my uh, pre- presentation today. So Bahrain island is very very well known for its connection with the Indus civilization. However, it is still unknown how how and when the connection developed. I mean we don't know or we don't know much about uh, we don't have much evidence to discuss about the uh, how the connection developed and when and uh, uh, when the connection started and when the connection ended and the nature of the connection is also an issue to be further discussed recent studies on the indus related artifacts from the island uh, especially by by my own work are revealing the importance of this connection during the late phase of the indus urban period especially between the uh, between the bahrain island and gujarat So this presentation overviews the available evidence to better understand the significance of this maritime connection. So you can see the location of the Bahrain. I mean, the, uh, here is a very small island of Bahrain, 
and uh, here is a uh, Persian or Arabian Gulf, and the uh, Indus is here. And to the uh, northwest, I mean, there is uh, Mesopotamia. So the Bahrain is uh, is, uh, is is on the very you know strategic point. I mean, linking the Mesopotamia and the Indus. So the, this is the chronological chart, I mean, uh, of Bahrain, Oman Peninsula, Mesopotamia, and in this valley, I mean, to show you the chronological relationships between the regions. So the Bronze Age, I mean, the, this part, the Bronze Age on the Bahrain island is called the early Dilmun period. This period can be divided into two phases. The early phase dating to the late third millennium BC, this part, and the late phase dating to the early second millennium BCE, this part. So this early Dilmun period is almost almost contemporary with the Indus civilization, especially on its you know uh, with its latter part of the urban phase. When you look at the chronology in the Oman Peninsula, the latter part of the Umm Annar period is contemporary with the early phase of the Dilmun period. And the uh, Wadi Suk period uh, uh, corresponds to the late phase of the early Dilmun period. And in Mesopotamia, the Akkadian and all third dynasties are contemporary with, uh, almost contemporary with the early, early phase of the early Dilmun period. And the Isin Larsa period of the early second millennium BCE is contemporary with the late phase of the early Dilmun period. The period when the early Dilmun culture emerged can be regarded as a period of the climax of the developments of interregional trades and interactions over southwestern Asia. So, as I showed you the, on this map, I mean, you know, uh, the interregional connections between Mesopotamia and the Arabian Gulf, Arabian Peninsula, and the Indus region uh, had its climax towards the end of the third millennium BCE. And uh, this is a map of the Bahrain island. I mean, you can see the scale of this island. I mean, it's just uh, 50 kilometers from the north to the south and uh, just uh, 25 kilometers from uh, east to west. So it's, it's just a very small island and the archeological sites and the remains are con concentrated in the northern half of the island. So you can see the name of the archeological sites on this island. So you can see some black dots, I mean, which represents the habitation site, including the temple site. And uh, the settlement sites are quite limited in number. I mean, just two have been known. I mean, it's a very big question. I mean, very, very big mystery actually. But uh, still, I mean, the, despite the tremendous efforts by archeologists, I mean, only two have been uh, identified. And some other sites, I mean, just like uh, this one, um, uh, Ain Umm Sujul and Dira's East and Barbar Temple. I mean, these are the temple sites. I mean, not the, you know, the actual settlement site or habitation site. And uh, you can see some uh, areas, I mean, which are marked by purple lines and bluish lines down here. So these represent the uh, extension, I mean, the extension of the burial mound sites. So uh, in, in contrast with the settlement sites, I mean, you can see, uh, you know, the extent of uh, the, uh, the burial mound sites quite widely on the northern part of the uh, island. So I am going to show you some, I mean, some, some slides of some, I mean, well-known sites in Bahrain. So this is a site of Karatul Bahrain, which means a Bahrain port. So it's, uh, it's located in the northern edge of the island facing the sea. So the site has been ex extensively excavated by the Danish and French teams since the 1950s. And it, it has provided a long sequence of occupations from the Bronze Age through Iron Age to the historical period. The chronology of the early Dilmun period also depends on the evidence from stratigraphic contexts at this site. And uh, uh, this is a plan, I mean, contour map of the site. I mean, it's a quite large scale site. And in the center, uh, in the center of the mound, I mean, there is a fort constructed by the Portuguese 
in the 15th century. And uh, uh, excavation revealed the, the Portuguese fort uh, on the top of the mound. And uh, around that uh, Portuguese fort, I mean, several trenches have been put to, to investigate the earlier deposits. So in, in one corner of this mound, I mean, this area, I mean, the uh, 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 trench, I mean, quite, quite extensive trench was placed by the Danish team. And uh, this trench revealed the remains of the fortification wall dating back to the third millennium and second millennium BCE. So from this trench itself, I mean, several, you know, uh, the gulf type seal, I mean, covered with uh, this kind of short horn bull or bison and in the scripts was found. And you can see the, uh, you can see the picture of the Baharian fort. I mean, here is a Portuguese fort on the top of the mound. And below that, I mean, there are uh, a very thick deposit dating from the uh, early Bronze Age or early Devon period to the Iron Age or the early history period. So these are the remains of the uh, Iron Age uh, period. And uh, this is a Barbar temple. So as I told you, I mean, several temple sites have been identified by archeologists and some of them have been excavated. And the Barbar temple is one of them. I mean, it is a representative one in, I mean, one representative example of the temple sites in Bahrain. So, I mean, uh, from this site, uh, from this site, I mean, very, very large scale temple complex belonging to the early Roman period was exposed back in the 1950s. The temple was accompanied by a tank with fresh water. I mean, this is a tank I mean, made of stones and, and uh, this dates back to the uh, early second millennium BCE. And at the time of the excavations, I mean, there was uh, plenty of water, I mean, uh, sprung up from the underground, but nowadays it's, it's been dried up. But still, I mean, this, is, this was a very important area in this sanctuary and some archeologists some archaeologists compared this tank with the basing tank found at Mohenjo-daro back in 1950s or 1960s. So uh, this is a very important uh, component of the temple. And from the foundation level of the temples, I mean, this, these kind of artifacts were found. So you can see the, uh, the bull head made of bronze and you can see a kind of stone container, I mean, from which several offerings to the god were found. So the offerings include includes this kind of stone, I mean, the lapis lazuli bees and the carnelian bees and some gold artifacts. So they are, uh, of course, they are very, very important for worshiping the gods, I mean, at this temple. I mean, they are kind of sacred artifacts from this temple. And uh, actually, as I told you, I mean, they, there are several burial mound sites which have a very extensive uh, distribution of burial mounds. So this is one of the uh, burial mound sites in Bahrain, Wadi Asel. So large scale burial mound sites appeared around 2300 BCE on the island. Before the 1980s, the burial mound sites belonging to the early phase of the early Dilmun period widely spread over the periphery of the central highland of the island. But because of the land development since then, the site of Wadi Asel is the only preserved burial mound sites of this early phase at present. Since 2015, a Japanese team, I mean, including me, has been exca excavating this site and getting very good evidence to better understand the society and culture of the early phase of the early Roman period. So as you can see on these images, the burial mounds at this site are kind of Kerun burials made of stones. The, uh, they have a low mound. I mean, they are not so high. I mean, they are just, I mean, they're quite low mound with a single stone chamber in the center of the mound. So uh, in, this, in this photo, it's not so clear, but in the center of the mound, I mean, there is a chamber like this one. And uh, you can see some uh, human remains, human bones in, inside, the, uh, inside the stone chamber. 
And basically, one single dead body was entered in the chamber. So there was no, uh, there was no burial, uh, burial chamber with multiple skeletons. So the, the burial mound in Bahrain are basically for one single person, I mean, to bury. And grave goods are quite limited in number. In many cases, I mean, they are none. However, bones of goat or sheep were found in association with human bones, indicating, uh, indicating the offering of animal, uh, probably animal meat to the dead. And in some burials, I mean, pottery and stone bees were recovered. I mean, I, I, I will show the images of the stone bees, I mean, later. But the, uh, the pottery vessels from this site belong to the Mesopotamian type or the Omani type called Um Annal pottery. Uh, as far as uh, our excavation is concerned, I mean, we have not found any single shard of uh, industry related pottery from this site. However, the stone bees made of carnelian and agate are likely to have been imported from the Indus region, as I shall discuss later. So uh, basically the preservation condition of the skeletons, I mean, human skeletons are very, very bad and uh, most of the parts of the skeletons were uh, decayed. And uh, sometimes it's very difficult to lift them up from the stone chamber. And we have been trying to get some teeth for strontium analysis or DNA analysis, but still, you know, our research is going on. So maybe in near future, we will get the good samples for strontium or DNA analysis. And uh, this is a map of the excavation area, which is allowed for our project. I mean, the, by I mean for the Japanese team. So in this part, I mean, we have counted 266 burial mounds. So you can see the scatter of the burial mounds. I mean, throughout the excavation area. But outside this excavation area, there are I mean, there are a number of burial mounds. I mean, they are not. Uh, <coughs> permitted to, to excavate because they are located in the military, military area. But still, I mean, still, I mean, this area has, uh, uh, has more than 250 burial mounds, which are good for excavations for our project. Oh, uh, and uh, I, I, will, uh, I will make mention to this photo as well. So this is the main burial mound and uh, with, a, with a single stone chamber in the center of the mound, but uh, attached to it, there are two additional small uh, mounds with small chambers were built. So this is also a very distinctive form of burial mounds in Bahrain. I mean, not only the early phase, but also in the late phase of the early Dilmun period. And uh, this is another site, I mean, which is called Ali. I mean, it is uh, one of the World Heritage Site inscribed a couple of years ago. And uh, <laughs> the site of Ali, the, which is located to the north, north of Wadi Asel, is a larger burial mound site belonging to the late phase of the Ali Dilmun period, that is the early second millennium BCE. So, I mean, the, we, are, uh, we are currently uh, doing survey at this site, and uh, more than 5,000 burial mounds were built, I mean, were identified at this site. And uh, among the burial mounds at this site, there are extra large burial mounds. So you, uh, in this photo, I mean, you can see a number of uh, very, very large uh, burial mounds. So uh, here are the cars, so you can see the size of the burial mounds. I mean, they are very huge. Sometimes, I mean, the, uh, they have 30 meters or 40 meters in diameter and more than 10 meters in height. So uh, these uh, extra large burial mounds have been regarded as a, as a burials for kings or chiefs during the early second millennium BCE. And from this period, some cuneiform inscriptions have been found from this, I mean, from this island. And they tell us that there was a kingdom ruled by the Amorites king. The Amorites are said to have been originated in the northern part of the Mesopotamia and migrated to the different parts of Southwest Asia uh, from the uh, late, late third millennium BCE onwards. 
So uh, they also migrated to the island of Bahrain as well, and they established a kind of kingdom. And uh, they came to this form of island, most probably for the importance of this island in the maritime trades across the Gulf. So, I mean, I mean, you can see a number of burial mounds here. I mean, they are all burial mounds, I mean, artificially made. And, uh, uh, and uh, just to the north of this area, I mean, uh, uh, there's an uh, there area allocated, allocated for the, uh, for the uh, loyal burial mounds. And this is a general map of the burial mounds at Ali. So here is a you know, dense concentration of small to medium sized burial mounds. And to the north of this area, there are some large mounds. And the further north, I mean, there are several extra large burial mounds, I mean, probably of the, the loyal families of this island. So this map is from our ongoing projects in Bahrain. So now I am going, uh, now I am moving on to the main topic of today's lecture. I mean, that means the maritime trades between Bahrain and the Indus civilization. So, I mean, uh, before looking at the evidence of the maritime trades between the two regions, I am going to have an overview of the Indus urban period in Gujarat, because it seems that the Gujarat played an important role in the maritime trades with Bahrain, especially during the second, uh, the early second millennium BCE. So recent studies on the ceramic evidence from the, uh, from the Indus civilization or the urban period the, the urban period can be divided into at least three phases. So the early, middle, and late. And this chronological division is made, um, is made based on the stylistic changes of the classical harp and pottery, including painted ones and praying ones. So, I mean, this kind of chronological, I mean, the, uh, this kind of attempts to divide the urban period into several phases based on the ceramic evidence was first made by a uh, French archaeologist, Gonzac Kibron, based on the stylistic change of the painting, I mean, paint, uh, paintings on the Harappan pottery, like this one. But uh, I mean, following to this, I mean, uh, following to his study, I mean, I have been trying to divide the urban period, uh, including the praying pottery as well. So, I mean, I worked at the site of Farmana and Kamer and uh, the Mitata as well. So, I mean, I have a very good evidence, I mean, ceramic evidence from those sites covering the entire urban period. So, I mean, the, those evidence have been used by me to establish this kind of chronology. Still, I mean, we need more data, we need more analysis, I mean, to, you know, to make this uh, chronology much, much more solid or much, much more established, but still, you know, this kind of chronological divisions can be helpful to, to examine the uh, you know, inter-regional relationships between the Indus civilization and the surrounding areas. So this chronological division, I mean, the three uh, periods division can be, divide, can be applied to the sites in Gujarat. At Doravira, stages one and two, I mean, belong to the early phase and stage three to the middle phase and stages four, five, six, seven to the late phase of the urban period. And in the case of Carmel, I mean, period one can be equated with the early phase and uh, period 2A to the middle phase and uh, periods 2B and 3 to the late phase. And the whole sequences, sequences at, the, at the sites of Surkotada and Lotra seems to belong to the late phase only. I mean, um, I mean, based on the ceramic evidence, I mean, the, you know, occupation at these two sites, Surkotada and Rotal, uh, can be affiliated to the late phase of the urban period. The transition from the urban phase to the post-urban phase cannot be traced well, I mean, especially the, you know, the ceramic style, based on the ceramic styles, but the ceramic evidence shows that the period around 2000 BCE was a very, very significant phase for the ceramic transformation or ceramic changes to Langpu 2C or 3 styles, uh, uh, which have been attested in Gujarat around the early second millennium BCE. So around 2000 BCE, different, uh, different ceramic styles 
started to merge to creating a new ceramic style. This is a very important point for our understanding of the in the ceramics from Bahrain as well. I will show you some images of the ceramics from Gujarat. And uh, it is also important to point out that the ceramic evidence of the late phase in Gujarat is characterized by the widespread distribution of black and red ware whose origin seems to be in Aravali Hills or Rajasthan. So these are the images of the artifacts from Gujarat, I mean, especially from Kamel, uh, at which I worked for the excavations. So, I mean, the, in Gujarat, I mean, the, uh, there are several ceramic styles from the pre-urban period down to the, you know, uh, the urban period. So this is one of them, I mean, which is called Anarta pottery, and then the Kraskar Harpan pottery, Sorat Harpan, and Black and Red Ware, as I, uh, as I made mention. And uh, uh, when you look at the, uh, these maps, I mean, pre-urban and early urban means uh, the early phase of the urban period, not the early Harappan, uh, not the early Harappan period. I mean, the early phase of the urban period and the late phase of the urban period. So, I mean, the, in, during the pre-urban period, Anarta pottery was widespread in this area, especially in the northern Gujar North Gujarat and the Kutch. And then, I mean, then at the time, I mean, cottage pottery came down to this region and a uh, number of sites in North Gujarat have yielded, I mean, cottage influenced pottery from burial sites. And uh, during the early phase of the urban period, I mean, starting, uh, starting around the 2600 BCE, the Kraskar Harpan pottery came down to, I mean, came from Shind to Gujarat and uh, in, during this phase, I mean, uh, there are Anarta pottery and Kraskar Harpan pottery, I mean, consume, consumed at, even at one site. So there was a kind of, I mean, mixed consumption of uh, Anarta pottery and Harp Kraskar Harpan pottery during the early phase of the urban period. But I mean, in the late urban period, the you know the black and red ware came down from the Aravari Hills to to the you know to Gujarat and uh, you know Sorat Harappan pottery was emerged. I mean Sorat Harappan pottery emerged in Gujarat, and uh, still the Kraskar Harappan pottery were imported from Sindh. So there was a very very complex mixture of the ceramics. I mean several ceramic traditions uh, during the late phase uh, late phase of the urban period. And the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the many excavations at sites in Gujarat have revealed that this region was a center of craft production as well, especially stone bead production. It is because the region of Gujarat includes a number of sources of raw materials, I mean, especially agate, carnelian, jasper, and amazonite, and copper and steatite sources in the Aravari Hills likely contributed to the emergence of Gujarat as a product, uh, craft production center. It is also important that steatite seals, I mean, this is an example from the site of uh, Bagasara. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, uh, there are a number, I mean, there are several evidence of steatite seal production, even at the sites in Gujarat. And these are the uh, industry-related ceramic vessels from burial mounds in Bahrain. I mean, they date to the early second millennium BC. And uh, as I told you before, the, uh, the, our, our burial mound sites at Wadi Asel, I mean, have not, uh, has not yielded any kind of industry-related pottery, but uh, from the sites dating to the early second millennium BCE, there are a number of this kind of pottery, which I, identif which, which I, I have identified as the industry-related pottery. So actually, I mean, the, uh, as I told you already, I mean, just now, the, during the early second millennium BCE, these types, in the, these types of industry-related ceramics became dominant, quite dominant, along with the locally made barbar pottery. The industry-related ceramics are distinguished from the barbar pottery, I mean, uh, the local ceramics, by having narrow and wide necks and rounded base. 
So you can see you can see the you know narrow necks and uh, the rounded body, and they, most of them have a rounded base as well. And in terms of technology, I mean, manufacturing technology, they are marked by the use of wheel fashion technique, along with scraping on the lower part of the vessel. So, I mean, these, you know, I mean, the, in my drawings, I mean, you can see this kind of parallel lines. I mean, they represent the, you know, uh, uh, the wheel marks, I mean, wheel throwing marks. Uh, throwing marks. And uh, on the lower part of the body, I mean, you can see the, you know, you can see the traces of the scraping. <laughs> and in terms of the decorations, I mean, simple parallel bands are quite distinctive. I mean, uh, you can see them on the number of factories. I mean, examples here. So these kind of parallel strokes are, are dominant uh, element of the decoration on the pottery from uh, Bahrain. And uh, along with them, I mean, there are some kind of geometric uh, designs, I mean, which are uh, quite simple. So, I mean, these motifs generally have their parallels in Gujarat and in some other parts of the Indus region. So collectively, the Indus related ceramics from Bahrain can be regarded as belonging to the, I mean, the mostly the Gujarat style. So these are other examples from other sites, I mean, Madinat Hamad and Saar. I mean, they are all, you know, very remote sites in Bahrain. So these are the, some examples, I mean, the, some photos of some examples from the pottery from uh, Bahrain. So you can see the, you know, you can see the de uh, painted designs and you can see the shapes as well. And uh, one of the one of the pottery from uh, Bahrain, I mean, you can find a very quite typical Langpu three or two C or three painting motifs, uh, just like this. And these are the images of the Barbar pottery, which were locally made. So you can see you can see the differences between the you know this kind of pottery, I mean the industrial pottery and Barbar pottery from the same island. So that means the uh, you know industrial pottery from the Bahrain are quite distinctive, and uh, uh, this is a kind of you know illustration to show you how you know how the the how the morphology of the Gujarat pottery de developed to the to the pottery from Bahrain. So these are the examples from Gujarat. So uh, these are the examples from Carmel, especially, and uh, you can see the you know similarity uh, in morphology and decorations between between the um, between the pottery's from two regions. But uh, in the case of the Solat Harappan pottery in Gujarat, basically they have a rounded flat base. But uh, in the case of the uh, in the case of the pottery from Gujarat, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Bahrain. They have a rounded base. I mean, that's a that's a quite dis dis distinctive difference between the two. And uh, this kind of narrow neck jar or narrow neck bottle are quite rare in Gujarat, but still they are there are some examples in Kamer and Surkotada. And uh, you know they might have been you know prototype of this kind of narrow neck jars or bottles from Bahrain. And uh, this kind of semi-hemispherical balls are, is a quite unique element in the Solat Harappan pottery, but uh, they are quite rare in the collection from Bahrain. But still, I mean, there is one example from, uh, from this site, uh, from the sites in Bahrain. And now I will, move, uh, uh, I will be moving on to the bees. So stone bees have been discussed as a very, very important evidence for examining the interregional relationships between the industry, industrialization and the West. Especially a number of discussions, discussions have been made on etched or breached carnelian bees as representing the direct evidence between the, uh, be, I mean, direct evidence of the connections between the two regions. But not only the breached bees, but also drilling technology can be regarded as the important, important evidence to identify the origin of stone bees in Mesopotamia and the Arabian Peninsula 
as has been demonstrated by the by the works by uh, made by Professor Mark Kenoya. So I also have been working on the drilling, drilling technology based on the evidence from the Indus region and Bahrain. So I am going to show you the preliminary results of my work on the drilling technology. And these are the, uh, the examples from, from Gujarat. I mean, these are the bees from Carmel, and uh, these are from Navinar, and these are from Kumwa. Uh, uh, they're all uh, located in Kutch. So the evidence from Carmel belongs to the middle and late phases of the urban period, and the ones from Navinar to the late phase, and the ones from Kumwa also to the late phase, based on the ceramic evidence. I mean associated with these bees. So when you look at the uh, drilling technologies uh, by the SEM images of the silicon impressions, two types of drills have been confirmed on these evidence from the three sites in Gujarat. So one of them is the arnestite drill as represented by the straight cylindrical profile and the very smooth surface. You can see the cylindrical profile down here, and uh, they have a very smooth surface. So that's a, they are the very distinctive features of honestite drill. And the other is the tapered drill. I mean, you can see the tapered profile on these uh, images. So, I mean, according to the uh, Professor Mark Kenoya, they were probably made of solid copper. So this type is very distinctive in having groove, grooved surface as well as the tapering profile. So you can see a number of grooves around here, which are not, I mean, uh, which are absent in the case of the honestite drill. So that's a very, you know, uh, very significant difference between the honestite drill and the cup, uh, solid copper drill. So when you look at the uh, number of the, you know, uh, the percentages of, uh, of these two dream, dream techniques, the blue cars are this kind of uh, honestite drill. And uh, this kind of orange to brown cars represent the, uh, the solid copper drill. So in the case of Carmel, I mean, the, these two types uh, are 50% and 50% almost. But in the case of Nabinal, the solid copper drill are quite predominant. And uh, also at the site of Kungwa, the, uh, uh, this kind of taper drill is quite predominant. So, I mean, the, my speculation is that uh, towards the end of the urban period, maybe the, this kind of solid copper drill with a tapering profile became much, much more dominant or dominating in the drilling technology. Uh, instead of the anesthetic drill. So it's just a speculation and it's not con conclusive at this moment. And uh, uh, as I show you the, uh, the, in the later slides, I mean, the evidence from Bahrain can show the both types. So the anesthetic drills and solid copper drills. So that's also a very interesting feature uh, uh, in the examples uh, from Bahrain. So these are the uh, these are the stone bees from our excavation that Wadi Asel, I mean from the late third millennium BCE. So num the number of bees from this site are not so large. I mean just thirty three bees in total from thirteen burials. So it may indicate that the maritime trade was limited in scale during this time period. That means the late third millennium BCE. And when you look at the shape and the morphology and size of the bees, I mean, the quite short ones are dominant. You can see a very number, a very short bees made of carnelians down here. And there are some, you know, I mean, this kind of, I mean, longer bees as well, but they are quite limited in number. And there is no bead with a breached design. That means etched carnelian bees in the specimens from our site. But uh, as you can see, the whitish surface uh, of carnelian bees are likely to have been artificial. I mean, the artificially treated with a kind of, you know, the alkaline uh, uh, 
uh, to say, I mean, the, they, they have been, you know, artificially treated with this kind of whitish surface. So, I mean, the that technique is basically common to the etched carnelian bees. I mean, the etching technique or breaching technique. So, uh, you know, the, these are a kind of artificially treated surface. And uh, these are the examples from the late phase of early Dilmun period, dating to the early, early second millennium BCE. And they are uh, uh, the number of the number of bees from this period are much, much more than the preceding period. That means the late third millennium BCE. So even in one single burial, more than 100 bees have been found. So that's a, that's a very, you know, uh, outstanding difference between the late, uh, the, I mean, the early phase of the early demon period and the late phase of that period. So the bees from this period are more diverse in morphology and size, and they compose long accessories. So in the case of the 100 bees, I mean, they may, I mean, they may have composed a very long, bee, uh, long uh, necklace. I guess. And they are exclusively made of carnelian, but many of them are coated with, uh, coated by white surface, which seems to have been artificially treated, as I mentioned in the, uh, in the last slide. So when you look at the uh, uh, drilling technology, the examples from Wadi Asel are quite dominantly represented by the anestite drill or stra straight cylindrical profile with very smooth surface. A few of short bees from this site were perforated with pecking technique. And for the bees from the late phase of the early Dilmun period, I mean, uh, these are the examples from uh, Wadi Asel. So you can see the you know straight cylindrical drills with a very smooth surface, which represents the honest uh, honest type drill. And these are also examples from Wadi Asel. So along with this kind of uh, honest type, I mean the straight cylindrical hole uh, perforated by the honest type drill. I mean you can find this kind of you know uh, short bees with uh, pecking technique. So you can see the rugged surface on, on, the, on the surface of the holes. They represent the, you know, uh, the use of pecking technique to make a hole. And these are the examples from the uh, late phase of the early Dilmun period. So uh, two types have been confirmed. That means uh, this kind of uh, straight cylindrical hole uh, perforated by the anestite drill and this kind of tapered hole perforated with, drilled with uh, you know, uh, the solid copper drill. So you can see a distinctive grooves, I mean, on the surface of the holes. So which uh, uh, it is very unique to the solid, solid copper drill according to the Professor Mark Kenoyer. So, I mean, the, those two te techniques or technology are identical with the examples from Gujarat. But uh, still, I mean, uh, I mean, I am not in conclusion that the, you know, they, uh, these bees were imported from Gujarat because, I mean, to identify the source of the, I mean, identify the place or region of the productions, I mean, you have to do some kind of chemical analysis using INAA or ICPMS or something like that. I mean, I have not done any that kind of chemical analysis so far. But still, you know, the drilling technology can tell us that the bees were made at least by the technology of the Indus region. And uh, uh, actually, I mean, this is a final, I mean, the last to final topic of this presentation. So I am going to talk about some seals from Bahrain. So, I mean, the seals are another evidence to better understand the maritime trades between Bahrain and the Indus region. So as widely known, I mean, this kind of uh, gulf type seal covered with a, a short horned bull or bison along with the Indus scripts have been known, I mean, for, uh, I mean, have been known to archeologists for a long, long time. 
but uh, several types several types of seals have been identified not only they are not only the you know industry related seals but also other types of seals have been known uh, from the gulf region and uh, one of them is of course i mean this kind of uh, steatite circular seal with a bison and uh, with in the signs or in the scripts and on the back side, I mean, they have a double boss. I mean, in the case of this one, I mean, the boss is engraved with four parallel lines, but still, I mean, they have a bison and uh, and a series of uh, in this signs. And the second one also has a circular shape and a double boss on the back side, but the iconography on the obverse side is quite different from these types, I mean, the industry, industry related Gulf types. So, I mean, in some cases, animals are carved with a very crude carvings. And in this case, I mean, a pair of booths are engraved, I mean, on the surface of the seal, but uh, the arrangements are quite different from the case of the, this kind of industry related seals. So there is a kind of a, a pole with a crescent uh, in this seal. So this kind of pole with a crescent is a very unique element of iconography in the uh, uh, in the Dilmun, seal, Dilmun type seal, which appeared following to this type. So the, these uh, Dilmun type seal appeared in the early second millennium BCE and they persisted to, persisted to the to maybe around the 1700 BCE or so, e or so the iconof iconography are totally different from the industry related seals and the backside I mean the boss on the backside is also different from the from the case of the industry related seals but still they are made of steatite and uh, they were fired around uh, at, at the temperature of uh, 940 degrees or so. So they used, uh, you know, they, they used the similar technology to fire the steatite to make seals. So that's a kind of legacy of the Indus seals uh, uh, in the Gulf region. So according to the Stefan Lausen, I mean, Danish archaeologists and others, the seals in the Gulf region have been supposed to develop from the first type, I mean, this type, and uh, it changes to, to the second type. And finally, the, this kind of Dilmun type seal uh, emerged during the early second millennium BCE. So the first type, the first type, that means this one, uh, is assigned to around 2100 BCE to 2000 BCE. The second one, uh, the ones in the centers, are uh, they are dated to around 2000 BCE. And uh, uh, these types are dated to the early second millennium BCE. So it has been also argued uh, that the Indus related Gulf type seal developed by the immigrants from the Indus region in Mesopotamia or Western Iran, not in Indus. But the transition from the Gulf type to the Dilmun type seals are likely to have been occurred on the Bahrain island, according to Stefan Lausen. So this is a map with the fine spots of the, this kind of Gulf type seal, I mean, from Southwest Asia. Uh, so of course, I mean, in it, also in, in this region, there are some Gulf type seals with a, a, with a blue and a short in this inscription, but uh, more numbers, more seals have been found in Mesopotamia, I mean, Southern Mesopotamia and uh, Firak Island and Bahrain Island. And one seals have been, has been known from the uh, Western Iran. So, I mean, the, you know, the this map shows you the you know more distributions of this type in the in the Gulf region or the Mesopotamian Mesopotamian region. So I mean the seals, I mean the examples from the southern Mesopotamia, as you can see, uh, the bull with uh, uh, with a kind uh, with this kind of trough, and uh, there is a short inscription on top of the bull. But in the case of the seals from Bahrain, there is no trough. Oh, sorry. 
uh, there is no trough, I mean, the, below the head of the bull. So that's a kind of trans, uh, iconographic transformation from the earlier type to the late type, I mean, which have been attested in Berlin. And uh, my interest in the Gulf type seals is regarding their carving technology. I mean, to compare them with the uh, uh, with the carving technologies used for the Indus. I mean, the used for the Indus seals from the Indus region. So the morphological features, iconography, and inscriptions of the seals from Bahrain clearly indicate an outstanding influence from the Indus seals of the Indus region. But uh, the, my question is, how about the carving technology? So it can be an important clue to better understanding how this unique seal style, that means the industry-related uh, Gulf type seal in the Gulf region was developed and produced and whether in the seal carvers were involved in pro producing these Gulf type seals or not. So still the examination using scanning electron microscopy is going on, but the SEM images available create, clearly show apparent difference in carving style and technology used in the graph type seals. So, I mean, this is an example, example from Bahrain. So these are the image, SEM images of the silicon impressions from this seal. So, I mean, they are quite crude. I mean, you can see, I mean, uh, they are very crude and uh, they are not so oh, elegantly carved uh, not in the sophist sophisticated way. And uh, uh, this is uh, another seal from Bahrain. And also on this seal, I mean, the carving style is slightly different from the Aria one, but the, the, you know, the carving skill or carving quality is quite different, uh, the quite crude also in this case. They are far from the carving technology of the Indus region and both in, um, both in style, skills and quality. The execu ex execution of the details are also much inferior to the, of the Indus seals. So, I mean, the, this is an example from Bahrain and this is an example from uh, Indus. Uh, this seals for, is from uh, uh, Bagasara in Gujarat. So uh, you can see a clear differences in the carving styles and carving qualities between the seals from Bahrain and the seals from in this region. So the carving style and technology and skills uh, used for the in the seals in the in this regions are very, very, you know, uh, sophisticated and high skilled. So the surface of the unicorn is always executed with a very, you know, in, in a very fine way. And the details of the iconography and details of the inscriptions are also very nicely carved. But in the case of the you know uh, seal from Bahrain, I mean they are very crude. So when you look at the SEM image, I mean you can understand what was carved, what was engraved on the seals. So that that's a very clear I mean clear difference between the two. So I mean the, my tentative tentative conclusion is that the you know the industry, industry related seals from Bahrain were not carved by the you know Indus professional carvers. So they were locally made, and the skills and technologies are totally different from the prototype in the Indus region. So this is the last slide. I mean, so uh, my uh, sorry. So the maritime trade between the Indus region and the Bahrain island became active, quite active during the last centuries of the South millennium BCE when the stone bees appeared on the island, I mean, the, buried in the burials as attested by the examples from Wadi Asel. And it is not clear which part of the Indus region was the counterpart of the trade with Bahrain at the time, I mean, during the late, uh, late South millennium BCE but the evidence from the early second millennium BCE exhibits the Gujarat, uh, Gujarat as predominantly inco incorporated in the uh, uh, incorporated in the trading activities. The ceramic vessels are likely to have been imported from Gujarat to Bahrain. I mean, there is a chance or there is a possibility that the you know they were locally made. But still, you know, the uh, stylistic difference, technological difference, and some differences in clay or the fabric 
clearly show that the, uh, uh, the industry-related pottery from Bahrain were not locally made. And uh, the bees were also, I mean, quite probably traded from Gujarat or some other parts of the Indus region. However, the Gulf type seals are likely to have developed locally in the Gulf region and not directly connected with Gujarat or other parts of the Indus region. So this evidence indicates that the trading network was considerably complex and multidirectionally and multi-legged networks were connecting different parts of Southwest Asia and the connections between the Indus civilization and Southwest Asia were also quite complex. I mean, still there are many, many aspects when which I have to focus on I mean, by our studies. And the evidence from Bahrain is important for our understanding of the decline of the urban society in the Indus region. In general, the early second millennium BCE has been regarded as a period of decline of the urban society or trans social transformation towards the post-urban society. But in this uh, general trends of decline, the region of Gujarat was still active in trading activities, maintaining some kind of urban character. Okay, so thank you very much. I mean, that's it from me. I spoke too much. <laughs> no, no, no. You were very <laughs> well within time, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> I was not looking at the watch, so. Uh, so yeah. Sorry. I mean, thank you. Thank you, actually, for this wonderful talk. And uh, it was really uh, good to see a lot of materials coming from the Persian Gulf region, uh, indicating good uh, uh, contacts uh, between the Arab front and the Mesopotamian. I have a couple of questions I mean, to start with uh, before we look at the Q&A yeah. and the chat box. Uh, who could be using this uh, Gulf type seals or the Indus type seals uh, in the, in the <laughs> uh, the Harappans are the local yeah that's a big question or the yeah Harappans living in uh, these regions yeah that's right I mean the uh, some Harappan people I mean were living in Mesopotamia as well especially the southern Mesopotamia or maybe in Bahrain as well so they were using this kind of seals and they developed this kind of seals for their own. So as, as I told you in my presentation, the, you know, uh, the carving technology of the seals are totally different from that of in the, uh, in the seals in the, in this region. So I don't think the, uh, the, in the, I mean, the professional carvers came from the Indus region to Bahrain to produce the, that kind of Gulf type seals, but still they were using the in the scripts or in the signs. So, I mean, the, there must have been, uh, you know, Harappan people living in the Mesopotamia or Bahrain and uh, they, were, they were making their own network for, you know, for maritime trades. So, of course, I mean, that's an issue for, you know, very, very big debate. So, <laughs> And, and to... it is also interesting to see some of these uh, circular seals, the uh, Indus type seals in Mohanjadado, Chanudado, and even one example from uh, Dolavira. So yeah. it, uh, was it due to uh, some of these traders, they were actually visiting their homeland uh, for a while? Or? Yeah, that's also a very big question. I mean, of course, I mean, you know, if the Gulf type seal was invented or was created in, in Mesopotamia or the, uh, in the Gulf region, their presence in the Indus region, I mean, at uh, some size in, in the Indus region must indicate the presence of some people from the Gulf region to the Indus region. Yeah, and uh, of course, I mean the the Dilmun type seal from Lothal also yeah. indicates the the connection between the two regions. So, what about uh, the evidences of Harappan weights actually found from Bahrain? I mean, I have read somewhere about uh, the Harappan weights yeah, from right. cubical weights from Bahrain, and also the yeah. even the uh, Dilmun of uh, weight standard will uh, it's it's equivalent to the Harappan uh, weight standard. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I mean, the, at the site of Karatul Bahrain, I mean, several weights have been found. I mean, some kind of, you know, cubic uh, weights uh, have been found from Karatul Bahrain. And they, uh, they correspond to the, you know, the weight system in, the, in this region. Okay, okay. One final question from me. I mean, uh, Dr. Bishka, he compares uh, the tumulus burial of Dolavira 
uh, mm. and to to the ones at uh, Bahrain in, in morphology. I mean, what is your mm. opinion? I mean, what could be is there uh, can it, can there uh, any connection between these two uh, types of burials? I remember that those burials are from the period seven. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Period seven. No, 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 not period seven. I mean, uh, Dr. Bisht dates it to the Harappan phase, the Harappan phase. To, to the urban, yeah. urban phase. Okay. Yeah. Mm, I am not sure because, you know, uh, mm, I don't remember about, about it very well, but, but still, I mean, there's a possibility that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they were people from Bahrain, but still, I mean, I am not so sure. Okay. Uh, I, remember, I remember that uh, Dr. Bisht showed me a pottery from Dora Bira, which which exhibits some kind of similarity with a pottery from Gujarat or from, from Bahrain. I, I don't remember okay. very well. I, I have not found that pottery or, or in the in the final report of Dora Bira excavations. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering where it's gone. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you, and I now request uh, Sharda to moderate the q and session. Thank you, Professor Prabhakar. Um, okay, so I'll start from the ones at the top. Um, Shikha Rai asks, have you studied the composition of white paste on carnelian? Is it the same kicker which uh, was used for etched carnelian beads? And was it an attempt to replicate the shell or steatite beads? Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, I have not done any chemical analysis to identify the composition of that kind of white surface. So, I mean, the, we have to do it in, in future. So I don't have any evidence to talk about it. But still, you know, that's a big question. You know, is it an imitation of shell or steatite beads? I don't think so because, you know, I mean, the, compared to the steatite bees, I mean, making the carnelian bees are much, much more, you know, complex. I mean, in terms of, tech, I mean, the production technology. And uh, there are steatite seals in Bahrain as well. Mm -hmm. So I don't think the steatite, I mean, the, you know, that kind of white surface carnelian bees was an imitation of the steatite bees. And uh, shell bees, I don't think so. I mean, because you know, you know, in the, with the same, because, <laughs> with the same reason, you know, the Canadian Canadian bees, I mean, requires much, much more high technology to make them. So there must be some kind of meaning. But still, I mean, I I don't have any answer to it. Uh, if I can interject here, I mean, this this white colored uh, uh, transformation on the agate Canadian beads, it occurs. Uh, uh, because because of its long burial within the deposits, and also because of its heat treatment while manufacturing, like we have seen a lot of uh, this white coloration uh, or transformation on the agate cornelian beads at Dolavira also. I mean, we used to discuss a lot at Dolavira why this white color is happening, and okay. it it actually it's due to the chemical reaction uh, because of its heat treatment while manufacturing, and also its burial condition. I think it's not intentional white color. Mm, but still, you know, yeah, maybe, I mean, the, in the examples from Dorabira, you may have found, uh, you know, that kind of whitish surface. But uh, as far as my experience is concerned, I have never mm. seen that kind of whitish surface. I mean, on the examples from uh, the sites in the, in the Gagao and the sites in the Gujarat. So, I mean, that, that's a question and uh, we need to do some analysis on it. Okay, uh, so the same participant has another question. Is it possible that during the late urban phase, Lothal played an important role in Carnelian bead trade? Yeah, I mean, that's quite, I mean, possible. And uh, yeah, of, of course, I mean, the, uh, during that time, I mean, Lothal was a center of, you know, uh, center of trade and the center of production of bees. So yeah, of course, yeah, Lothal must, must play an important role. Um, so the next Actually, one, I mean, again, if I can interject here, again at Dolavira, we have uh, bead manufacturing workshop during the post Harappan, I mean, what is the, I mean, the late Harappan period. After 1900 mm -hmm. BCE, we have 
uh, huge workshops. I mean, actively uh, doing the bead polishing as well as bead manufacturing. So I think uh, Dolera was uh, definitely into some kind of uh, uh, trade relations. Uh, we may not pinpoint to which region, but ultimately uh, the mass production of uh, beads and the craft activities clearly indicates uh, towards uh, in this direction. Mm, but uh, you know, the, you mean the late Harappan, uh, yeah. you know, the seven. No, no, six. Uh, say six. Seven is completely. I mean, it, it doesn't have any uh, craft activities and all. It just has the circular structures. They, I mean, it is completely okay. uh, de-urbanized uh, local culture. Mm. Stage six, okay. you have this black and red, uh, black and red wear, uh, ceramics uh, predominating with that white color paintings. And uh, during that period, you have extensive bead manufacturing. Okay, so have you got the carbon 14 dates from stage yeah. six? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, what's one, or two, one or two dates. It, 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 it comes to around 1800, uh, mm. be, between 1900 to 1800 BC. Okay, that's very interesting. Yeah, okay. I, I, I will be reading the report again. Okay, so the next one is by Mr. T.S. Subramaniam, who asks, why is the iconography of these seals different from the Indus seals? Uh, but is the Indus script the same? So, I mean, I will, I will show you the slide again. Okay. Uh, this one. Yeah, actually, I mean, I am not a specialist of the in the scripts or in the science, but uh, according to Professor Asko Parpora, who is an expert of the in the science, I mean, he, he, he argues that the arrangement of the in the signs are uh, quite different from those on the in the seals in the in this region, and uh, they argue they I mean he speculates that the uh, you know. Uh, the Indus scripts on the Gulf type seal from the Gulf region represent the you know some uh, some uh, some language other than the language spoken in, in the Indus. So that may be a Mesopotamian language or some other language spoken in the Gulf region. So I mean, uh, is it a, is it the proper answer to his question? I hope so. Um, yeah, I don't see any other questions or comments from him. Maybe he will type something later. So I will move to the next one. This is by uh, Shamoon Ahmed who asks, have you recovered evidence of dockyard or trading center or centers with the material resembling uh, the other civilizations too? Mm, I, I, I don't get the... Uh... I don't get the question. I mean, so this is there question. any evidence uh, of a dockyard or a trading center with material right. which resembles other civilizations? Other civilizations? Maybe means... not in this, but some others. Uh, okay. Content. Yeah, actually, okay. I mean, there is no evidence of dockyard, but, uh, you know, Karatu Bahrain, I mean, the site of Karatu Bahrain is located uh, along the coast, sea coast. So that must be a kind of port town and trading center as well. So, I mean, the, any kind of dockyard has not been uh, excavated, but still, I mean, there must be uh, some kind of, you know, harbor to, to get the ships or boats. Okay. Uh, Professor Ajit Prasad um, compliments you for a very interesting talk. And uh, then he asks, what is your opinion about the absence of prestige in the beads in Bahrain sites? Most of the beads are atypical as far as their overall features are concerned. Do you think mm, they're atypical? I, I don't get the meaning of prestige in the beads in Bahrain sites. I mean, actually, I mean, I don't see any, I mean, there's such a big difference between the beads from the Indus and the Bahrain, but uh, what, what, Ajit Sam, what do you mean by prestige in your question? Okay, I think um, maybe we can. I think make... it, uh, it may be these uh, uh, decorated carnelian beads and the long barrel carnelian beads, the elite uh, uh, items. Mm, maybe. Okay. Maybe. Mm. 
Okay, so I mean, the, as far as my uh, knowledge is concerned, there is no, I mean, there is such a long, I mean, the long carnelian bees, I mean, from Bahrain. The longest one is just around uh, three centimeters or so. And uh, the, the etched carnelian bees or breached carnelian bees have been, I mean, have been ex excavated from some sites in, uh, in Bahrain. So they have a very clear design made by the etching or breaching technique. So, I mean, if Ajitsan calls it as a- He, he does mention later on, he has answered that question saying, he, he, yeah, he is referring to etched carnelian and long carnelian, uh, carnelian beads. Okay. I got it, yeah. So there's a, there, are, there are some etched carnelian beads from Bahrain, yeah. But not from our side. Okay. So um, next uh, one is a comment and a question. So this is by Professor Ajay Pratap who thanks you for a very mm -hmm. comprehensive overview. And he uh, found the talk very informative. So he asked, uh, did any views of the individual players or craft persons involved in this trade emerge through this study? And he also asks another question. Uh, he says, okay. it seems that state formation in Bahrain had already taken place in the time of the trade within the cities when the trade was going mm -hmm. on. Uh, but what is the view about the state in the in this area from the vantage point of or the view of Bahrain. Mm, yeah, actually, I mean, for the second question, the nature of state was quite different when between the Bahrain and the Indus. In the case of Bahrain, it's just a small island. I mean, it's just a, you know it developed as a you know a trading center for the maritime trade. But in the in the case of the Indus, I mean, it's few. It, it includes a vast area and, uh, you know, the concept and, uh, you know, the structure of the state must have been quite, I mean, totally different from the, from the case of Bahrain. And the uh, first question is an uh, individual um, player. Did any some... views of the individual players or craft persons involved in the trade emerge? Mm, actually, even in Bahrain also, I mean, some kind of, I mean, the, the seals were produced in Bahrain. And uh, those seals were made of steatite and uh, they were fired at a high temperature to make the white surface. That technology must have been, I mean, imported from the Indus or the, uh, uh, imported from somewhere in the, in the Gulf region through the, uh, through the Indus craftsman. So in the case, you know, I mean, uh, in my view, I mean, some kind of craftsman who who knows in the tradition to make the in the seals or in the crafts were living in the in Bahrain and they they produced some kind of, you know, that kind of seals. I mean, the uh, in Bahrain. So I mean, yeah, that's my answer. So this is another question by um, D. N. Dimri. Who asked? Do you uh, have have you excavated any habitational settlements in addition to the burial mounds at Bahrain, or is the study mainly based on the material found from the burial mounds? Yeah, actually, I mean, I I have not I have not participated in the excavations of any habitation sites in Bahrain because there are only two sites of I mean settlements in the island. So I mean, I haven't had any chance to to do excavations at settlement sites. But still, you know, the picture emerging from the set, I mean, the burial sites, I mean, are quite similar to, I mean, similar in the in the evidence from the habitation area, uh, habitation sites like uh, uh, Karatul Bahrain and Sar, which was excavated, ex excavated by the British team, I mean, 20 years ago. So, I mean, the, you know, the picture we can get from the burials are, I mean, are quite, you know, the same as those from the habitation area. So there's another question related to burials. This is by Satarupa, mm -hmm. uh, who asks, apart from the cane type burials, are there any other types of burials which are comparable to the Indus civilization? Mm, actually, there's no burials, I mean, comparable to the Indus civilization. Actually, I mean, especially uh, during the late third millennium BC, the Kerum barrier was dominant. But in the early, early second millennium BC, some kind of you know stone barriers uh, developed in the in the in the Bahrain. But they are not similar to any of the Indus 
uh, types. So we have two more questions. One is again by Mr. T. S. Subramaniam, who asks, uh, did you get any mariner's compass in Bahrain uh, made, out of, <laughs> made out of shell, such as mm -hmm. those found in Lothal by um, Sarao and in Kesara by Jitendra Nath? Mm, no, I mean, I, I have never seen that kind of compass, I mean, in the collection from Bahrain, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, the last question is by Shikharai, who asks, presence of large number of burials in the Bahrain area, does it indicate some sort of a strategy for creating ideological affiliation to cope up with changing climate? Because this is something it seems that was suggested uh, by Peter Johnson, who has, uh, uh, who has opined uh, this regarding megalithic traditions in Karnataka region. Mm, actually, I, I haven't, I haven't got. I mean, exactly what she means by the, mm -hmm. you know, by, by the, you know, ideological affiliation to cope up with the changing climate. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, of course. I mean, the 4.2 ka event must have affected on the, you know, on the on on the Bahrain Island as well, and the on the Gulf region in general. But still, you know, we don't have such a direct evidence to discuss the, you know, climate change in that region. So we have to see the, you know, we have to carefully see the, you know, material culture mm -hmm. or change material culture to see the, you know, impacts from the climate change. So, yeah, of course, that's a very important issue for discussion. Yes, so one last question, I just saw it. Uh, this yeah. is again by Professor Ajay Prata who asks, what about the function of the fields? What were they used for? So basically the, the main, main function of seals must have, been, uh, must, be, must have been for seeding. I mean, seeding the, you know, the package or parcels uh, to, uh, to be sent to the another place. I mean, I mean the, for the tra trading activities. But still, you know, I mean, the, as in the case of the industrialization, I mean, the number of the seals are quite limited in Bahrain as well. So, I mean, the seals may have multi, I mean, multiple purposes, multiple functions, uh, maybe a kind of a passport or something like that. But still, of course, I mean, it's a very important issue to discuss. Okay, so I guess we have covered almost all the questions. I have checked the chat box too. Okay, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, Michelle, would you have something to ask? Um, I, I was curious to know, um, Akinori, how would you compare the intensity of the trade with, mm -hmm. with uh, Gujarat or let us say the broader Indus region in, in Bahrain? With what we see elsewhere, the Kuwait region and the and the um, Oman region, is there any broad comparison that you have come up with? The intensity. Uh, yes. yeah. yeah, yeah. Actually, you know, I mean, I I have not uh, I have not worked on the, any materials from Oman or Kuwait, but still, you know, uh, according to according to some works by other scholars. The Indus related materials from the Oman Peninsula belong to the late third millennium BCE, not to the early second millennium BCE. So, I mean, the, in the case of the Omanis, I mean, the sites in Oman, I mean, they found uh, a number of classical harp and pottery, as demonstrated by the uh, Dennis Brennett in the last lecture. But uh, when you come to the Bahrain, I mean, there is no classical harp and pottery. So that's a big difference. And uh, according to my work, I mean, the, that, that shows a chronological difference. So the Oman Peninsula developed connection with the Indus civilization earlier than the earlier than Bahrain. But in later time, I mean, in later phase, the Bahrain came to, you know, came to, you know, function as a main trading center in the Gulf region. So that's do, my- Do you have any clues as to the kind of items that mm. were traded. I mean, from the archaeological remains, I know that mm. the literature has yeah. mentioned some items, but from the excavations, have you 
found a, any any clues as to the actual items of trade? No, I mean, I, I have no idea about it. I mean, especially maybe the, you know, Gulf region had a number of items from the Indus region, such as, uh, you know, carnelian beads and some potteries and maybe some, you know, organic materials as well. But uh, we don't know much about what Indus people got from the Gulf region or Mesopotamia as well. So there's a big question still. Thank you very much. It was it was extremely informative indeed. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean it was uh, really a fascinating talk, and it is always fascinating to see uh, the context between the Harappans and the Mesopotamians, and, the, and even uh, between the intervening regions. Uh, the looking into the age and the kind of uh, technology available at the point of time, it is always fascinating and. Uh, uh, it's uh, really happy to see more and more material coming and we can understand uh, uh, these uh, interconnections in a, in a much, much better manner. So I thank you, uh, Akinori, once again for this wonderful talk and uh, taking uh, your uh, time to deliver this talk. Uh, and we look forward uh, for much more interactions with you in the future also. And, uh, and we can collaborate if possible also. And I, and I thank all the participants uh, uh, for attending this talk as they have all, always done. And uh, we, we are going strength uh, on strength because this is our 10th lecture and we will be continuing this uh, every month. And I hope all of you uh, regularly participate and engage and hopefully we, we will be embark on different uh, uh, subject, uh, different time periods of uh, South Asian archeology span uh, maybe we have we have uh, looked into much about the index archaeology. We, uh, we we will move on to other uh, subjects in the near future. So thank you once again to to you. Thank you, Michelle Sharada, and all the participants. And we end the close here. Thank you.